Good afternoon, and welcome to Hudson Institute. The last U.S. nuclear test occurred in 1992, before President George H.W. Bush signed a bill establishing a temporary moratorium on nuclear testing. Then, on September 24, 1996, President Bill Clinton signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which its supporters claim would inspire the international community to rally with the United States on efforts like nuclear nonproliferation and would strengthen the NPT. On April, uh, but, but then the Senate went on to reject that, of course, and did not ratify the treaty. On April 5th, 2009, now President Obama gave his famous, his famous speech in Prague in which he laid out his ambitious agenda to take the world on a path to zero nuclear weapons. One of the uh, items on his agenda was to finally ratify the CTBT. He said, quote, to achieve a global ban on nuclear testing, my administration will immediately and aggressively pursue U.S. ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. After more than five decades of talks, it is time for the testing of nuclear weapons to finally be banned, end quote. But he did not immediately and aggressively pursue U.S. ratification of the CTBT. Instead, he has chosen to pursue a resolution at the U.N. Security Council to advance the aims of the CTBT. So today we will hear from the insights of uh, two dis very distinguished speakers um, about the tactics the administration is taking to uh, move the CTBT further along, and then also just about the merits or the contents, um, the substance of the treaty itself, and, and we'll discuss that as well. Senator John Kyle retired from Congress in January 2013 as the second highest ranking Republican senator. During Senator Kyle's 26 years in Congress, he built a reputation for mastering the complexities of legislative policy and coalition building, first in the House of Representatives and then in the Senate. In 2010, Time Magazine called him one of the, mo the 100 most influential people in the world. A member of the Republican leadership for well over a decade, Senator Kyle chaired the Republican uh, Policy Committee and the Senate Republican Conference. And especially rel relevant to our discussion today, he was an outspoken critic of the CTBT and was instrumental in its ultimate defeat. Steve, and Stephen Rademacher is a former Assistant Secretary of State and headed three bureaus of the State Department, including the Bureau of Arms Control and the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation. Prior to that, he served as Chief Counsel for the House Select Committee on Homeland Security of the U.S. House of Representatives and as Deputy Staff Director and Chief Counsel of the House Committee on International Relations. During President George H.W. Bush's administration, he served as General Counsel of the Peace Corps, Associate Counsel to the President in the Office of the White House Counsel, and as Deputy Legal Advisor to the National Security Council. And he recently testified um, before the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee on this uh, very subject we're going to hear from today. Um, and so with that, if I could, I'd like to ask Steve to, uh, to kick us off and to uh, just get us started on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, the reason we're here is because the, uh, of the President's Prague agenda, which uh, Rebecca referred to, um, and the fact that in recent years, the President had, has not made much progress on, on that agenda. Um, in fact, since the, the Moscow Treaty, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the New START Treaty uh, was negotiated in 2010, not, not much at all has really happened um, toward the abolition of nuclear weapons, uh, which is the President's stated goal. So here in the late stages of his administration, he's trying to, to put a few points on the board. And one of the areas he's trying to do that is with regard to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, and apparently the mechanism he's chosen is to go to the UN Security Council to uh, encourage the adoption of a res resolution relating uh, to nuclear testing and, and to the, the CTBT. The, um, a lot of people ask, why didn't he go to the Senate if, if he cared about this? Um, and uh, I think Senator Kyle will, will speak to some of the problems that, that he might face in the Senate. Uh, and so um, for whatever reason, instead of following the normal constitutional path to, to bring this treaty into force, he's, he's going to the UN Security Council. And when it was first announced he was doing that, there, there was a lot of apprehension, uh, especially in the US Senate, because they, they of course, don't like having their, their constitutional role uh, circumvented, uh, especially through through some sort of international organization, there was a fear that they, the, the, and, and you know, I think there are plenty of lawyers who would line up and say that this is entirely possible for the president to seek a UN Security Council resolution that bans nuclear testing. Uh, 
uh, basically rendering the, the whole CTBT moot. Um, now, I think there'd be a lot of problems with the international legitimacy of a resolution like that, and I think there are a number of important countries that might flat out reject it, but that option is open. Um, the, the president's spokesman w went to great pain saying, no, 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 that's not what we intend. And um, at, when pressed and, and you know, through a normal exchange between the oversight committees and, and the administration, what emerged is they're, they're apparently going to work at the UN Security Council with this idea that when countries sign a treaty, uh, they become subject to an obligation, and it, this obligation is stated, uh, set forth in Article 18 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, the, the, the countries that sign a treaty uh, under that, under that uh, convention uh, become subject to an obligation not to defeat the object or purpose of the treaty. And I mean, in concept, what they're trying to do, I think what the administration is trying to do, is um, gain acceptance of the notion that, okay, the CTBT hasn't come into force. Part of the reason that hasn't happened is because the Senate rejected it, but actually a bunch of other countries that are not really uh, anywhere close to ratifying this treaty need to ratify it before it can come into force as well. So let's forget about that problem. Let's just declare that everybody's at least partially bound by this treaty and, and, import, and most importantly subject to, the, to a legal obligation under international law not to do the main thing that this treaty would, would prohibit if it came into force. Uh, I think that's their concept. It's kind of clever. Um, there are a few problems with it, though. Uh, the first one is that the United States Senate rejects the whole notion of Article 18 of the Vienna Convention, the, the notion that when the president signs a treaty, it becomes partially binding on the United States. I mean, the view of the Senate is, you no, know, treaties don't become binding at all until the Senate votes to approve them. So that's, that's sort of a separation of powers argument that I think is in the background. And... Um, in, in choosing to go the direction that it's, it's chosen, the administration actually opens that sort of uh, separation of powers debate between itself and, and, the, and the Senate. Um, but it's further complicated in the, in the case of the test ban because what, via, what Article 18 of the convention says is a country is obligated not to defeat the object and purpose of a treaty it signs until it makes its intention clear not to, not to ratify. Okay, so there's an until, until a country makes clear its intention not to ratify. So in 1999, the United States Senate voted to reject the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and not just by failure to get the required two-thirds margin, but actually a, a, not even a simple majority was acquired. Uh, two, 51 senators voted no on that treaty. Does that amount to a, a declaration of intention on the part of the United States not to be bound by this treaty? I think, forget, forget about this particular treaty, just that question, when the Senate rejects a treaty, is that a statement by the United States that's not going to be bound by a treaty? I think most senators would say, of course. I mean, the Senate speaks for the United States in these matters. Uh, it won't surprise you to hear that's not the view of the executive branch. They think, basically, Senate action is irrelevant to Article 18 and whether the United States is bound. The president alone decides when the United States has an intention to be bound or not. And... There's a relevant history on this issue with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, after the Senate vote in 1999, Madeleine Albright wrote to a, a large number of countries around the world, and, and I'm going to paraphrase, but basically what she said was, our Senate just did a really stupid thing, but don't worry. We're going to persuade them they were wrong. We're going to persuade them to change their mind someday. But in the meantime, uh, the United States remains subject to its obligation not to defeat the object and purpose of this treaty. I mean, she, she represented that to the rest of the world. So she basically was saying to other countries, the Senate, what the Senate just voted is irrelevant with regard to the question of what U.S. obligations are uh, going forward as a signatory of this treaty. A number of senators didn't like this notion set forth in, in Albright's letter. Uh, the, the, the senator who was most upset is uh, with us <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, he wrote to President Bush once he became president, and basically, again, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, this was in 2003, you sent your first letter. Um, about that Albright letter, that doesn't speak for your administration, right? And so are we safe to assume that the United States is no longer bound not to defeat the object and purpose of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty? And you know, why, why haven't you expressed that publicly? Um, the State Department can be a recalcitrant organization. Uh, it took Senator Kyle five years to get an answer to his letter. Uh, he did not get an answer until 2008, but he did get an answer, and you had to write two more times. Uh, but it, in 2008, you got a letter signed by Secretary of State Rice, and on this question, the, the question raised by the Rice letter, uh, 
is the United States bound not to defeat the object and purpose of this treaty? And, and another way of asking that question is, does the United States still intend to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty? Her answer to Senator Cobb was crystal clear, no. We're no longer, we don't intend to ratify, we're no longer bound. Basically, scratch the Albright letter, forget it. That was, that was the message. So with all that history, um, it's kind of a mystery what the Obama administration is doing today. They got a uh, P5 statement, the, the five permanent members of the Security Council issued a statement last week, um, which affirmed that um, a nuclear test would defeat the object and purpose of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. That's, I mean, I, I think the Senate might disagree with that, but you know, that's, there are plenty of international legal scholars who would agree with that. What, what they didn't address there, and what to my knowledge has not been addressed, is the question of, given this history of the Albright letter, or the Rice letter, the Senate vote in 1999, does the United States have an obligation not to defeat the object and purpose of the treaty? Rice's letter said clearly no. And it would be interesting to find out whether Obama thinks that, that this obligation under Article 18 of the Vienna Convention is like a light switch, that depending on the president's state of mind, the United States is bound, the United States is not bound, the new president has a different view, it's bound again, um, or whether they stand by what, what Rice said. The language of Article 18 does not suggest it's a light switch. I mean, the word is until. And there's no implication that that could further change because the, you know, a new president has a different policy. But um, I think this is the que that question, you know, to my knowledge, it hasn't been put to the Obama administration, but where they're going on this tees up the question, which I'm sure someone in the Senate will ask, which is, okay, it's interesting you think a nuclear test would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. Is the United States subject to that obligation? Uh, I don't know what their answer will be. I, I think the, the, the options are they'll say they don't know, which will sound kind of ridiculous. Uh, they'll say, well, actually, the United, we, we stand by the Rice letter, and in fact, given the history of consideration of this treaty in the United States, the U.S. isn't bound. But then, of course, the upshot of this whole exercise is they've gotten the U.N. Security Council to essentially say the entire world is bound not to test nuclear weapons except the United States, which I don't think is the message they wanted to come out of this exercise. So <laughs> um, that may, suggests maybe they'll say, well, actually, when Obama got elected, the light switch flipped again, and you, know, you don't see that in Article 18, but it's actually there, and, and we think the United States is bound. Um, that, they'll have a lot of, <laughs> they'll need a lot of lawyers to explain how, how they come to that conclusion. Or my prediction, um, what they'll actually do is what they did to Senator Kyle, they will just not answer. Um, and that's what they did to you for five years, but um, uh, at some point, there, there will be an answer because senators do have tools to, to force the administration to, ask, to answer straightforward questions like, having done all this at the Security Council, tell us whether the United States is bound. Thanks. That's a great discussion of uh, an important issue that really doesn't have an answer because it's a political question, I think. Um, it'll be interesting if a court were to ever confront it, and my guess is that the court would probably avoid it on political question grounds. And I also suspect that one reason that my friends in the Senate don't want to ask the question is that, as you suggest, the Obama administration would, of course, say, oh, yeah, uh, it'll bind us, uh, which would then require that we try to get the next administration to reverse that. But all of this... Um, silliness is, a, is strictly uh, for the president to build his legacy as the chief opponent to nuclear weapons in the world today. And this is the only way he could do it, since he knew the U.S. Senate would not revisit or approve the CTBT. Uh, it's my job to remind you all of the basic reasons why the CTBT was not just defeated in 1999, but was overwhelmingly defeated. We needed 33, 34 votes to defeat it, because it takes two-thirds of the Senate to ratify a treaty. But Trent Lott told me at the time, don't just come to me with 34 votes. Make sure you've got a couple in reserve as a cushion, because these people will really twist arms to try to change minds at the last minute once we call it for a vote. For many months, Democrats on the floor of the Senate berated Leader Lott for not bringing the treaty to a vote. People like Senator Biden and 
Senator Kerry, and Senator Byron Dorgan, who at one point said, I will place myself on the Senate floor like a potted plant and stay here until you agree to bring it up for a vote. That threat was made pretty close to the time that I was about to tell Leader Lott that I had the votes. We had worked quietly for about a year to bring experts on nuclear weapons and uh, related security issues up to Capitol Hill to visit literally one at a time. And I remember going in to see one of my colleagues who I saw this morning at breakfast, Senator Collins, who told her group of interns that I was instrumental in persuading her that it was not a good idea to ratify the treaty, and it was a decision that she had been happy with ever since. And I remember visiting her on several occasions with experts to make the arguments to her. So when the treaty was uh, finally uh, called up, Senator Lott said, um, all right, I give up. We'll schedule the treaty for a vote next Tuesday or Thursday. I forgot what it was. And the Democrats were all too happy at that point to cheer until a couple of days from the time that the treaty was to be voted on when, having done their whip check, they realized that they had been asleep at the switch, thinking that people would vote to ratify it, but that we had talked to all of the Republicans and even people who they thought might be with them, people like Senator Luger, were going to vote no. At this point, they tried to delay, uh, to postpone the vote, and uh, to put it off to another time. Ambassadors from all over the world called in. The president called. The president called Leader Lott just before the vote began at 6 o'clock in the evening on whatever day it was that we had the vote. And he called me in. He said, are you sure you don't want to postpone it? I said, I know I'm sure because I can see two of my colleagues, Republican colleagues, getting letter signed that is going to ask you to delay it, and I don't want to delay it. Okay, Leader Lott said. We went out to take the vote. The roll was called, and the treaty was defeated with a majority, 51, of the senators saying no. So it was whipped, not just defeated. And the reason was because it's not a good idea. Think of the reasons in two categories. The first is it fails to achieve the objective that the supporters have for it. Divide that into two pieces. The first objective is that our moral example will persuade other countries not to test or to develop nuclear weapons. That isn't true. It hasn't been true empirically. We stopped voluntarily, stopped our testing in 1992. We haven't tested since, and yet many other countries have conducted tests since then. Does anybody in their right mind believe that this would persuade Iran or North Korea, for example, not to test simply because the United States isn't testing? The answer is clearly no. So it fails for that reason. The second general reason that it fails to achieve its purposes is that it is fatally flawed. First, it's flawed because it doesn't even define what it purports to prohibit, and uh, neither does the language in the United Nations resolution. Uh, nuclear test is not defined, and the reason was made clear by one of the witnesses of the administration who testified in 1999 that said, we decided not to try to clarify the language because it would have been too hard. And yes, it would have been too hard because some of the countries who had already decided they thought the treaty was a wonderful thing had, uh, had defined the term themselves to enable them to conduct certain types of, quote, experiments. I'm speaking of Russia. Um, Russia and China have both... Um, according to certain uh, uh, public sources, uh, conducted experiments, nuclear experiments, uh, which they would not characterize as testing. But the U.S. definition has always been a zero yield of radiation, in effect, which would prohibit some of the kind of testing that's been done by countries like, like Russia. The point is, it doesn't even purport to define the activity that it would prohibit. That's kind of a fatal flaw. Second problem is it's not verifiable. Now, there's been a lot of progress in verification since 1999 as we've got more sensors placed around the world. We've improved our techniques of sampling of air and soil and the like. But the reality is that um, you still don't necessarily know when a test has been conducted. I think the North Korean test in 2009 is a good example. They told the world they were going to test a nuclear weapon. There was a big explosion. Um, we picked it up on seismic instruments around the world. But we could never 
verify that it had been a nuclear test. We didn't have the capability. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which you can mask a nuclear test. I'm not going to get into them, but trust me, they exist. Uh, the Russians are very good at, at doing it. And so it isn't necessarily verifiable. But if you stipulate that you can, without any question, figure out whether or not a test has occurred, the third problem is the, the really fatal flaw. It's not enforceable. Okay, you've, you've picked up a lot of signals that there's been a test. Now, these are all done, or virtually all done, with methods that are highly classified, with techniques that are highly classified, which we're not going to share with other countries. But we make the allegation uh, to 50 countries, which comprise the group that has to be convinced, 31 of the 50 have to be convinced, they have to have a, a suspicion that there's been a violation before you even begin to put into motion the enforcement mechanism. You can imagine who these 50 countries would be. Look at the countries of the Security Council to begin with. So how are you going to convince the Russians to agree that they conducted a test when you don't have any evidence that you can share with anyone, and naturally they're going to uh, try to argue to the contrary? It would be exceedingly difficult to get the requisite number of countries to begin the process of an inspection, at least within any relevant time frame, that could potentially verify that a test had occurred, which even if that were to be done, would then raise the question, what now? What do we do? Well, we could always pass a UN resolution sanctioning the country that tested. Really? 17 times evidence was, and I would say incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence that Saddam Hussein had violated UN resolutions was taken to the Security Council. No enforcement. The will to enforce wasn't there. And I dare say it's doubtful that it would be in a case like this. So you'd have one country that believes in the rule of law and for sure will abide by it. That's the good old US of A. And everybody else cheating. And nothing can be done about it. The point is the treaty cannot achieve its purposes. The second big reason it was defeated is because it's bad. It's not good for the United States. We need to have at least the potential to test these weapons at some point. And if we ever bind ourselves unequivocally never to do so again, we will have given up an incredible um, scientific advance and, I would argue, um, one of the key reasons why we've been able to maintain stability and not have the major superpowers of the world killing each other since 1946. It's interesting that there was a lot of, of uh, I, I don't know how many million people killed in, in wars, just say from 1900 to 19. 46, when the weapon had been used, and uh, very few deaths have occurred in any conflict between the world's superpowers, those with nuclear weapons since then. They do provide a deterrent. They are a deterrent. You need them for a deterrent. And the problem is our weapons were never designed to last more than a few years because we had new designs coming online all the time as a result of which we have weapons that were designed 50 years ago, were built 30 years ago, uh, well actually longer than that, 40 years ago, and we have no way of knowing whether they're still reliable, whether they're still safe. We know that there are ways to improve their safety and reliability, but we voluntarily decided not to um, add those elements or substitute those, those elements. Uh, that would probably require testing because the weapons themselves um, are, are not easily um, subject to replication. That is to say, the way that they were built, as well as the materials used back when they were built, let's say in 1970 or 1980, um, would not be the way that they would be built uh, today. We found that out when, during one of the life extension programs, what we've done is we've gone to taking these weapons apart, putting them back together again, kind of shining them up, trying to make sure that, 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 they, uh, that they look like they did before. And you can replace some of the components in the triggering mechanism, the radar and so on, in the front of the, of the weapon, but you can't mess with the uh, nuclear components themselves, at least according to the administrations that have been in charge. And uh, what we found is, for example, that some of the material that was used to cushion uh, 
the warhead uh, within the casing as it goes flying through space at a very high rate of speed, being shaken, being very subject to hot and cold temperatures and the like, we couldn't replicate the material. We had the recipe, but we couldn't make it. The cake didn't rise. And it's now, uh, this was highly classified for a long time, but at least the point has been made now in public uh, sources that um, the people who made the weapons back then understood that you had to put a little more baking soda or sugar or whatever it is in the cake mix in order to get it to rise right. So it wasn't exactly the recipe. But when we finally figured that out, then we could sort of replicate the material that was used. We don't even make uranium in the same degree of impurity that was used back then. We're so good at purifying it today, it would be much more pure. Well, what would that do to the, uh, to the nuclear reaction that occurs? Nobody knows. And how are you going to know if you don't test? Without getting into a lot of detail here, the experts will tell you all kinds of reasons why you have to test. But here are just a couple more. The big experiment here is that we're going to rely on stockpile stewardship. We're going to model how these things work with computers. And we're, we're so good at modeling and, and computer science that we can predict what's going to happen with this, with this nuclear reaction here. Well, you can't. But the experts who are in charge of and get a lot of money every year to run the stockpile stewardship program will swear to you that they've gotten really good at it, and they're pretty darn sure that they can predict what these weapons would do. Two of the last people who designed and built and tested our nuclear weapons, Dr. Johnny Foster and Dr. Steve Younger, will tell you, both lab directors, by the way, will tell you, that the biggest problem we have is the hubris of the scientists and others who believe that they can predict what would happen without ever testing. And if you just stop and think about the enormous amount of testing we do on everything in the country, from consumer products to other weapons or anything else, now devise the most sophisticated thing ever designed by man, the nuclear weapon, and say, ah, we've got pure confidence that this thing will work after 40 years, even though... Uh, we haven't tested it, uh, but we're, we're, we're pretty sure. The final reason you need to test is to keep the ability to work with these weapons alive in your cadre of scientists who have the obligation to try to accomplish this. We don't have now any more people working at our labs who designed, built, and tested these weapons. They're all gone. One reason that countries like Russia continue to do experiments is to keep a cadre of scientists together who are very knowledgeable and expert at handling these materials and understand how they work. And without that group of people ready to go, a country is, uh, is playing with fire, just to put it bluntly. The United States needs the ability to test if and when we decide it's important to do so. And had we ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we would have foregone that as a matter of law forevermore. Those are the reasons why it should not ever be ratified and why the UN resolution is a bad idea. Thank you, sir. It's wonderful. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to take the liberty to ask a couple questions from our panelists, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor for a few minutes of discussion from you all. So be, please be thinking about questions that you might have. I'd like to turn to Steve first. Um, some of those who are in favor um, of ratifying the CTBT or even just using going down this road that the administration is going down to further the aims of the CTBT, one of the things they say is that... Um, if President Bush had really not wanted to, to, to do this, that, that, that Condi letter just wasn't enough. He should have actually been uh, more forceful himself. He should have written a letter to the UN himself. He should have been more clear, and he didn't. And therefore, we can see that, that, um, that actually, you know, he was bound. He was sort of internationally bound. That's the argument that they make. Um, First of all, is there anything to that? I assume you'd say no. Um, but can you explain sort of why that, uh, why that doesn't matter in this instance? Well, um, Caesar, while I actually look for a copy of the Rice Letter, because, um, you know, first of all, the people who said that, I'm quite confident uh, none of them have actually read the Rice Letter, <laughs> because um, 
uh, she states very clearly in the letter that she answers all those questions. You know, in a letter from the Secretary of State of the United States to the gentleman seated to my left, she answers every one of those questions, and she says, um, the president didn't have to speak to this. We didn't have to un you know, formally unsign the treaty the way the, the Bush administ administration did uh, with regard to the, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, that public statements by administration officials coupled, and she cited a whole bunch of statements by administration officials affirming to international audiences that the United States did not intend to be bound by this treaty. That coupled with her letter, the United States was, and she states, she stated, to Senator Kyle, as a result of all that, the United States is no longer bound. And, um, you know, yeah, it wasn't, the pattern was not identical to the, the pattern that the administration applied with re regard to the International Criminal Court. But, you know, read, I would say to anybody who wants to make that point, they should read Rice's letter and then explain how the Secretary of State could have gotten it so wrong. And let me just tell you, having worked at the State Department, you know, she didn't sit down at her word processor and type this letter. This le letter was written by the lawyers in the, the Office of Treaty Affairs of the Legal Advisor's Office of the State Department, because Article 18 of the Vienna Convention, those guys in that office are the experts, and they're going to write the letter. And they wrote this letter. And you know that, that's why I think it's going to be hard, actually, for the Obama administration to disavow the, the, the Rice letter, because it was the opinion of the treaty experts in the, in the State Department, many of whom are probably still there today. And it's going to be kind of awkward for them to say, well, actually, she screwed up, but really it was we who gave her bad advice. Um, you know, that, part of the reason it took five years for Senator Kyle to get the answer to his letter was they didn't want to have to admit that they gave Secretary Albright bad advice. And, and interestingly, if you read the Rice letter, they are at great pains to explain why, Rice, why Albright wasn't wrong. It's just that you know, circumstances have changed. And you know, so whatever they do, you know, they're in kind of a hole here if they don't want to. The easy answer is to say, well, Rice got it right, and, and the United States isn't bound, and sorry, rest of the world, you know, you can repudiate the treaty, too, if you want. Um, I don't think, again, I don't think that was the message they wanted this exercise to send, so they're going to be very hesitant to, to admit that. But if they want to take any other, if they want to give any other answer, it's going to be extremely complicated, and I think it's going to force them to, to disavow what they told Secretary, or what Secretary Rice told the Senate. That's great. And Senator Kyle, um, you you touched on this in your opening remarks, but one of the, the main arguments that those who support CTBT make is that um, that if the United States were to do this, that we would be we would be setting an example, we would be persuading others to do the same. Um, but it's curious because they're making this argument on the heels of the fifth nuclear test by North Korea. North Korea. Um, the Russians, of course, are uh, spending enormous amounts of resources modernizing their own nuclear weapons. Uh, the 2009 Bipartisan Strategic Commission, um, some of the, uh, the commissioners had mentioned in the report that they believe that Russia continues and possibly China contesting, uh, testing low-yield um, nuclear weapons. So um, given, given that body of evidence that we have, can you help us just understand the argument a little bit better and explain why, especially today, given this um, you know, global strategic environment that we have, beyond you know, 1999 when the treaty failed. Why it makes what, sense. Is, is there a country western song, something like, who, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? And uh, this is a religion with these people. They don't have to have evidence. In fact, um, you, you just have to believe. And that's to have faith in your faith. That's the whole concept here. So no, there's, there's no evidence to suggest that if we set an example, others who don't want to, will follow it. And in fact, all of the evidence to the contrary. And that's why it's so ironic that they use the North Korean example as the reason we have to go to the Security Council now because North Korea is a rogue country. It's, it, look look what they're doing. They're testing these nuclear weapons. Yeah, but we set an example. They shouldn't be doing it. Well, somehow or other, this will be different. And uh, because it's a matter of, of religion with them, it's not a matter of science or empirical um, data. And of course, um, the but, but, by the way, just one other thing on Steve's point. My friend Doug Fyth, who is here, uh, who served in the Bush administration, has made the point on numerous occasions to me that um, that one other thing that almost gets to the point of religion is how strongly the administration's lawyers, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat administration or a Republican administration, 
will fight for the prerogatives of the executive branch. They will go to great lengths to defend the executive's prerogatives. And yet, in this one particular case, and I'm sure the reason, one reason it took five years is because there was an enormous intra-departmental um, division on this, and it required an awful lot of work by a lot of lawyers finally coming to the conclusion that they could put in, in writing that this was one instance where they didn't have to defend the executive's authority. I'm sure it would have been fun to be in that room and, <laughs> and seen some of those debates. Um, on that point, too, what, what can the Senate do? And this might be a good one for Steve or for the senator. Um, what, what can the Senate do when they see the administration is, is circumventing um, the Senate? Um, there, are, there, there already has been pushback from Senator Rubio, Senator Cotton, um, Senator Cruz. I know that there are many others who, who have opposed the administration going down this route. But what mechanisms can they actually use to, to, to stop to, to, to stop the, the president from doing this in his last couple months of his second term? Well, it's a challenge for the Senate because um, <clears throat> the president's intentionally trying to circumvent the Senate. So you know, there's no sort of piece of legislation here that's before the Senate that they can, can uh, act on. Uh, so what they would need to do is uh, you know, they have normal tools. They can hold up nominations. They can hold up other treaties. Um, uh, they can use the tools of oversight, which they've already started doing. The, the Foreign Relations Committee held a full committee hearing on, on this very issue two weeks ago um, to, to highlight uh, the, the threat to, to Senate prerogatives uh, posed by what the administration was doing. Um, but uh, if they want to go beyond that, if, if those tools aren't sufficient, um, you know, there are legislative remedies. Uh, legislation was introduced uh, just in the – it might have even been today that it was introduced – um, to, in both the House and the Senate, uh, I think it was Senator Cotton in the, the Senate and uh, uh, Congressman Joe Wilson in the, in the House uh, taking the lead. And their, their legislation um, would cut off funding to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, which um, is an organization that is trying to run the monitoring system that is to be created under the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. You know, I, I think this whole international organization has sort of a a tenuous hold on life because it, it, it exists to implement a treaty that has never gone into force, has not gone into force in 20 years, and has no realistic prospect of going into force in the next 20 years. Uh, and yet, this organization somehow exists without a treaty constituting it, and um, it's getting contributions from nations. And, and, and so, anyway, this legislation would, would cut off the U.S. contribution to it. Now, you know, what's the future of that legislation? I mean, it would have to be passed by both houses and. and either signed by the president or the president's veto would have to be overridden. So, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't express optimism about the legislation's chances, but, I mean, it's an example of what, uh, what the Congress can do. And what will be interesting here to me, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican, um, so it, it's easy for me to say this, but, you know, for the Democrats, um, I, I think they're torn, the Democrats in the Senate, because, you know, the I think many of them actually support the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. They support President Obama. They support the Prague Agenda. So they want to be supportive of what the president's doing. On, on the other hand, um, I, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, no matter how worthy the objective, they're not going to be supportive of the notion of violating the Constitution or diminishing the Senate's prerogatives in order to achieve a worthy objective. So uh, I think they're probably withholding judgment to see what exactly the administration does. Um, and my sense, watching this from the outside, the, you know, especially in the wake of the hearing that took place two weeks ago, I, my sense is the administration is, is dialing back its ambitions. That there was an early draft of the Security Council resolution that, that uh, I don't think was intended to be circulated to the, to the U.S. Congress, but um, you know, it, it's a sort of a legislative process that takes place at the U.N., and, and so the U.S. mission has to circulate a draft resolution to other countries that are represented on the Security Council. And, some members of Congress obtained a copy of the, the initial draft. And it, it was your typical binding UN Security Council resolution under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, including a number of uh, operative paragraphs beginning with the word decides, which is the way that the Security Council tries to make law, um, create international, you know, binding international law. Um, and um, that, that was the initial draft. Uh, since then, uh, I don't think the administration was initially aware that Congress had that. and. Once they realized there were members of Congress who were upset, they, they started insisting, oh, no, this isn't going to be binding. It's not going to be under Chapter 7. Well, clearly that wasn't the original intention because the first draft was in, under Chapter 7. And 
That draft explicitly said the reason we're doing this is to create a body of international norms of behavior that can become enforceable under international law. I think you're exactly right on the assessment of the, of the, the stomach that the Senate has, including the, the Democrats, especially um, after the Iran deal, which even the Democrats who fell in line and eventually supported the deal weren't happy about the way it was done. And so um, this is just one more thing at the end, I think, that, that displeases a lot of the senators. Um, on that note, if I could just take um, a couple questions from the audience. Doug? A fellow here at Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, Steve, you said that the Senate, well, you, you pointed out that the administration's approach at the UN is based on this concept embodied in Article 18 of the Vienna Convention that a country that signs a treaty, even before it's ratified it, gets international legal obligations to refrain from any actions inconsistent with the object and purpose of the treaty. You then said the Senate rejects Article 18 of the Vienna Convention. I, I'd appreciate if you would explain that. I mean, who's the Senate when you say the Senate rejects it? I mean, and you know, who speaks for the Senate? And then the and, and what is the status of the Vienna Convention on Treaties? Is the United States a party? Uh, and if not, why not? And then the other thing is, is there any legislative initiative that could be taken to clarify what obligations the United States undertakes when the president signs or authorizes the signing of a treaty? I mean, might there not be a legislative initiative that announces to the world that because of our constitutional considerations, when we sign a treaty, there are no obligations that the United States is taking on until the Senate has spoken and there's been a ratification? Okay, well, uh, for the sake of our, the rest of our audience, let me say you and I ought to have an offline conversation about this because we'll be way down in the weeds, and, and I don't think everybody else needs to, <laughs> needs to be down in the weeds with us. Uh, but when I say the Senate rejects us, uh, obviously there is no such thing as the Senate, uh, but um, with a single opinion. But um, there is some history here of the, of the Vienna Convention. It, it was uh, signed in 1969. Uh, submitted to the Senate in 1971. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee held hearings. Uh, it reported a resolution of advice and consent with a reservation. Actually, it was a condition. Um, and the condition was basically aimed at protect. The Senate was upset about a number of things. In fact, there was an issue about executive agreements and the degree to which they're bound, uh, binding on the United States. And the Senate was most upset about that and the way that the Vienna Convention would, would seek to make executive agreements binding on the United States as a matter of international law with no Senate approval required whatsoever. Um, so anyway, the, the Senate put forward a condition which the Nixon administration rejected, uh, and so the treaty stalled. Uh, in the 1980s, there was another round of hearings on the Vienna Convention. Same issue confronted it. Uh, the two sides. And so there's never been, the Senate has, has rejected the Vienna Convention. And, and, and this principle set forth in Article 18 um, is, um, it's interesting because there's a separate source of international law that you're familiar with, the restatement of foreign relations law. Uh, the second restatement, which issued in 1965, never mentioned this principle, nor did the first restatement. Uh, that was the 65 was the second one. 69, this treaty gets signed that contains this principle. So the, the third restatement, which is issued in 1986, it suddenly contains the principle. But then the reporter's notes indicate, well, actually, you know, th th this is, this, they, they track it to the Vienna Convention and say, you know, this notion is, is kind of, it's, they, they phrased it, uh, more familiar to writers in the civil law tradition than in the common law tradition. In other words, it's sort of a Euro continental European concept, not something that, that America had previously recognized as, as customary international law. So, you know, and, and I, you know, why is that? Well, unlike in a lot of European countries where ratification is, is sort of pro forma, you know, if Vladimir Putin signs a treaty, there's not much risk that the, the state Duma is going to reject it. Uh, you know, when, when you know, Louis the Fourteenth signed a treaty as the sovereign, there wasn't 
a question of you know some somebody rejecting his signature. Um, in America, where we have a constitution and coordinate branches of government and and a genuine separation of powers, that question does arise. And you know, the, the, just because the president signs a, a treaty, is, it's not a foregone conclusion that the United States will ratify. So I, I think it's actually understandable why the the reporters of the, far, of the restatement on foreign relations law said. Conceded that this was not really a common law concept that they were incorporating into the restatement. So, um, anyway, it's, it's right now you know it's comfor it's a comfortable idea to the executive branch lawyers that hey the president he can sign the treaty and it's maybe it's not entirely binding. The Senate has to do some other things to make it totally binding. But we're like halfway bound, right? I mean, we can't defeat the object and purpose. Uh, and even if the Senate rejects the treaty, the president can still decide. Um, we can't defeat the object and purpose, and we're still bound. I mean, that, if you're an executive branch lawyer, that's that's great. I mean, it maximizes the authority of the president, but kind of hard to reconcile that with the role of the Senate in approving or disapproving uh, the, the imposition of international legal obligations on the United States. I have worked in the nuclear field most of my professional lifetime. And I'm wondering if there's the real issues being discussed here, because the real issue is, I believe, the magnitude of the damage that a, um, a hostile use of nuclear weapons will do, not to a city like Hiroshima, but to mankind, because the weapons are now a thousand times greater each one is a thousand times greater in destructiveness than previous. So the main issue is getting rid of it in order to preserve mankind, which would be endangered in usage of the present inventories with their destructiveness. And President Obama, as I understand it, although I'm not a scholar on this subject, uh, working with Putin did indeed go f very far towards this objective of cutting out the danger to mankind by cutting down the inventories of the U.S. and of Russia in nuclear weapons. But as I understand it, Putin has sort of stopped, and so Obama had to stop, and so the danger continues. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate your question. Um, and I would say that everybody here would agree with you on the aims, which is to avoid <laughs> nuclear uh, confrontation, um, though we might disagree with um, how we get there from here, and Senator Kyle might be able to speak to that as well, because I, th I think, and he, he did speak to this in his remarks, um, we need to maintain the ability to test because we want to actually maintain the credibility of our nuclear weapons so that it has a credible threat of force so that other countries won't be, won't dare to use their nuclear weapons. Um, no. And, and you're right that the president would like would have liked to have gone even further, and the Russians said no. And I think that is really the answer to your question. There are countries, such as Russia, that simply will not get rid of their weapons, and, and the weapons cannot be uninvented. That's, that's the real problem. And as long as others have the capability... Uh, it is important for the United States to be able to blunt that capability, and there are two ways to do it. The most effective way that has worked now since 1945 or 46 has been to be able to threaten anybody that dared to use it uh, with a response that would be unacceptable. The better way, if you could ever implement it totally, would be a missile defense or other defense to the delivery of the weapons so that it would not pay for a country to develop these weapons and threaten others with them. But we're a long way from having that capability. And I do think it's interesting that the main thrust of the Russian government today, in addition to modernizing their nuclear weapons and delivery systems, is an effort at all costs to prevent the United States from developing the defenses against the Russians' use of those weapons. Uh, that, to me, tells us that as, at least as long as that attitude exists, the United States cannot relax its defensive capability, both with the strategic nuclear deterrent and the development of missile defenses. Yes, sir. Just weekly. Um, 
I wanted to ask uh, to the panelists to follow up on Steve Rodemaker's point about the CTBTO. So do you think it would be correct uh, action to withhold U.S. funding for the CTBTO, CTBTO and ultimately for the organization, for other countries to do the same and for the organization to be essentially dismantled and abolished? Thanks. So, so the, the, the legislation I referred to, I, I don't think actually automatically cuts off funding to the, the, the CTBTO. And, and let's be clear, the United States has, both under the current administration and under the Bush administration and under the, the Clinton administration before it, all three have, have decided to fund the CTBTO. So um, I think that must represent a decision by all three administrations that, that uh, irrespective of the status of the treaty, the, this organization was doing some useful things. Uh, I don't think the, uh, I know the legislation doesn't automatically uh, cut off U.S. funding. It, it, would, it would cut off U.S. funding if uh, the Obama administration, or I guess any U.S. administration, uh, obtained a decision by the U.N. Security Council that sought to make um, the, the CTBT uh, binding on the United States in any way, including by, by propounding the notion that the U.S. was subject to an obligation not to defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. And, and uh, let me add to that, I don't think, that, from what I've seen so far, you know, there was a P5 statement which states that a, a nuclear weapons test would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. But that statement didn't say we, all five of us members of the P5, are subject to that obligation. It didn't say the United States is subject to that obligation. So the P5 statement would not trigger the cut off funds that, that set forth in that legislation. Now, we, we haven't seen what the Security Council will do uh, if, if it uh, takes up this issue and approves a resolution. But I mean, if it does something analogous to what the P5 said and sort of just affirms that there's this obligation for signatories but is silent on whether the United States is subject to that obligation, then I, I don't think the, tr the trigger in that legislation would be pulled. Well, I, I didn't mean to suggest that it like it's, it's an illegitimate organization. I'm sure that that, and I haven't researched this, but I'm sure that you know it's been constituted in a way that you know it's able to receive funds and and carry out its activities. But I mean, it, it is sort of an anomalous organization that you know something that was created to implement a treaty that has not in 20 years, and I, I think few people would confidently predict that in the next 20 or 30 years it, it will. Uh, have a, a, a binding treaty that it's, uh, it's implementing. To me, there's only one reason to fund it, and it's questionable, but at least it's a rationale, and that is that it can be used as a supplement, as a way to verify, to legitimize a U.S. conclusion that our methods of verifying uh, are correct. That is to say, if the United States says we've detected an explosion of the North Koreans, it is some value for this organization to say, yeah, we did too. But our means up to now have been much better than, than the international means. So they're more a matter of verifying, uh, giving credence to the U.S. allegations uh, rather than as a substitute for question over here. Hi, I'm uh, Pierce Corden. Um, I'm presently a visiting scholar at the IIIS, but I had the, uh, what shall we say, distinction of having worked on the test ban issues from 1971 until today, so I've had a long uh, involvement with it, including spending five years in Vienna as the senior American at the test ban organization from 2002 to 7, uh, when the U.S. wasn't fully funding the organization. Uh, uh, but uh, the issues that I would want to sort of raise, uh, as Steve Rademacher was saying, are ones that are uh, probably require a long dialogue, and so uh, I'm not really going to try to do that. But, uh, but I would want to react uh, to the observation about uh, whether Russia and China agree uh, with the scope of the treaty. And based on uh, Ambassador Ledegar's testimony uh, to the Senate, uh, back in 2009, and my own involvement with it, I would have to say that uh, I know of no uh, legal reason why there would be any difficulty uh, with uh, concluding that all of the parties to the treaty understand uh, 
what the scope of the treaty is, namely that it bans any nuclear weapon test explosion of any yield down to zero. Uh, there was a great deal of dialogue at the time about thresholds and this and that and the other sort of thing, but I think, in fact, it's pretty clear. Uh, I'm aware of, of course, what the uh, uh, Senate Commission said about Russia and uh, Chinese uh, potential taste testing in violation of that, if that's the case, and the administration, either the Bush administration or the Clinton uh, or the Obama administration hasn't gone after those states, then uh, the, that's not good for, for what the U.S. Has, has been doing to try to uh, maintain the unilateral moratoriums, uh, which one assumes <coughs> are, uh, the same as what the scope of, of the treaty would be. So I do think there would be uh, room for understanding that there is indeed agreement on that. Uh, as far as the, the need for further nuclear testing, I think the Stockpile Stewardship Program is a lot more than just computer uh, simulation. It involves an enormous range of experimental activities using very large machines at Livermore, Los Alamos, at Sandia that can look at uh, many of the components of a nuclear uh, weapon uh, down to, to uh, well, to the, to the components. Uh, the, the weapon can be tested uh, up to the point where it would go critical. And so I think that, that the people who are in engaged in the Stockpile Stewardship Program uh, not only have the, the uh, computational capabilities of the advanced computers, uh, but the experimental data that has been acquired in the last uh, 15, 20 years from that program. Can, can I respond to both of those? Uh, I, I take your last point, and I'm been trying to summarize a lot of information into a, <coughs> into a fight. Uh, it's a lot more than computer modeling. You're absolutely correct about that. My, my, <coughs> my point there is that people have unimpeachable um, knowledge, people like John A. Foster and Steve Younger, make the point that no computer modeling system that has not been verified through experimentation um, can be relied upon totally. And, and this is something you have to be able to certify. And the experiments that are done don't ever get you to the point of the nuclear criticality. And that it would be nice to verify the modeling with an experiment that actually could do that, but that's prohibited by our moratorium. As to your first point, I'll respectfully disagree. Um, <coughs> and with, with, uh, we may just have to leave it at that. As you know, there's a great deal of, um, um, the United States government has a lot of uh, intelligence about what the Chinese and Russians have done. And um, we've reached certain conclusions about that. And uh, I don't know today whether uh, Mr. Lavrov or whoever's in charge uh, would say, oh, no, we agree with you, it's zero yield. I, I don't know what he would say, but I know in the past what they've done, and I assume that they do things that they uh, believe they can defend in a legalistic way in an international forum, which would be inconsistent with what they've done. I'll just put it that way. So, can I just comment? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave shortly. I have a train <laughs> to catch. Um, but on this point about, you know, are there different definitions or not, you referred to the Bipartisan Commission, the, the Perry Schlesinger Commission, which issued a report in 2009. It was bipartisan, half Republican, half Democrat. They, lo they looked at a whole bunch of issues. One of them was the CTBT. They agreed on everything except the CTBT. The Republicans said no. The Re Democrats on the commission said yes. Um, I'm just going to read two things from the report, which I think actually explains, taken together, explain why, the answer to the mystery, why President Obama cares so much about this treaty in seven and a half years, he hasn't done anything to try and get it through the Senate. Um, the, uh, the Republicans, in their explanation of their position, they, they, in this report, they said, the treaty remarkably does not define a nuclear test. In practice, this allows different interpretations of its prohibitions and asymmetrical restrictions. The strict U.S. interpretation precludes tests that produce a nuclear yield. However, other countries with different interpretations could conduct tests with hundreds of tons of nuclear, nuclear yield. And then it goes on to say Russia and perhaps China are actually exploiting that, their different interpretation. Okay, the Democrats, they laid out their position. They didn't dispute that, okay? They did not disagree with that statement. And then, but on the CTPT, there was that one issue that the Republicans and Democrats agreed on, and that was the following recommendation. So this, this was unanimous, Democrats and Republicans. 
To prepare the way for Senate re-review of the CTBT, the administration should secure P5 agreement on a clear and precise definition of banned and permitted test activity. So unanimously, Bill Perry and, and a lot of other you know, prominent Democrats, experts in this field, said they can see there's a definitional problem, and it ought to be fixed before we take this treaty back to the Senate. That was in 2009. To my knowledge, this has not happened. Okay, why hasn't it happened? Either the administration didn't care enough to try, which I, I think they do care about this treaty, or they tried and they failed, and they just don't want to tell anybody about that. And if they failed, that raises interesting questions about why, you can't, why they couldn't get agreement in 1996 and why they still can't get agreement today. Or actually, the, the most pernicious explanation at all, and Pierce, you'd be the guy to comment on whether this is true, there was actually an agreement in, two, in 1996, an agreement to disagree. And the, two, the, the various parties understood they had different interpretations. They agreed, okay, we, we're going to just disagree, and you have yours, and we have ours. And I, Okay, well then, if we can exclude that one, the Obama administration ought to explain why they have completely disregarded the one bipartisan recommendation of this commission in 2009, why they've done nothing to achieve an agreed definition of what's prohibited. And, then, you know, and, I, and I would predict until they do that, this treaty is dead in the water. Thank you all for joining us today. Would you please join me in thanking our panelists?